Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another PMY Pro podcast. I'm Derek. And I'm Jerome. And today we have an exciting episode because last week we talked about the full stack ADA solutions, yeah. and we did dive in a little bit into the L40S. Yeah. And we told them that we're going to bring on the, the product manager to talk a little bit more in depth about that. Right. So today we're excited we have Zach Hauk. He's our category manager of compute GPUs. Welcome to the podcast, Zach. Hey, Derek. Hey, Jerome. Thanks for having me, guys. Excited to be here. Yeah, well, thank you so much for coming to the podcast, Zach. Um, so, Kia, can you tell us a little bit more about the L40S? Yeah, so the L40S is the new ADA card from NVIDIA, and it's really a beast when it comes to inferencing. And that's because of all the tensor cores that it has. And uh, it's it's really impressive what it's capable of. And the ability for this card to not only train AI models, but also to have so much power when it comes to the inferencing step is key when you're looking at generative AI. Yeah, and that was a big topic, especially at, you know, Seagraph again, and then just the keynote. I feel like that is that is the future going forward, again, mm -hmm. is AI. And I, I feel like we talk about that. We hit that topic yeah. a lot on all the podcast episodes. Mm -hmm. And it, I guess in terms of the L40S, uh, some questions we got to is, you know, when you get into generative AI or, you know, training an AI model, I mean, is there any data or anything you can share there in terms of just, I guess, how that L40S would fall within that stack or that line, like the performance? Yeah. Yeah. So I think the first thing to talk about is sort of like what it looks like to train an AI model, right? Is yeah. the, the basis of it is essentially you, you are designing your model for whatever purpose it is. I used an example of, uh, I think dogs the other day in the training where we wanted our AI model to be able to recognize all these different dogs, whether it's a dog, a cat, or what kind of dog breed it is. But I think you can even go a step further and, and apply it to a more uh, practical use or, or maybe even a better use than just the dogs. And you look at it in the sense of like training an AI model to view different CAT scan images and determine any abnormalities or anything that, that looks awry on a fresh CAT scan compared to a model that's been trained on, let's say like 10 million images. And so the way that works is if we were training our model, we would pump it with however many images we deemed necessary. It could be 10 million, could be 10 billion images. And in this case, if we're looking at CAT scans, you know, we would feed through all those images and then we would go to the validation phase. And in the validation phase, engineers and trainers are basically ensuring that the model is doing what it needs to be doing, that it's not just memorizing the data that's being dumped into it, but that it's actually learning from it. And I kind of equate that to like the kid who got all the answers for a test from his friend and memorized them in like ABD ABCD fashion, and then you've got the kid who actually studied and learned mm. and knows how to answer the questions. And that's the kid we want, and that's what we want for our model. So once we're through validation, then we go to testing, and that's where the inference comes into play. And we want the AI model to be able to infer based upon a new CAT scan or a new image that we've submitted to it without any tags. We want it to be able to tell us there's an abnormality here or this looks clean based on all the other images that we've seen, that we've been trained on, and that we know about. And that's where there's just so many possibilities and, and so many applications to it because you can use it for CAT scans. You can use it to identify dogs if you wanted to, something silly like that, but it's applicable all over the place just based on what the technology is and what the inferencing process looks like. Right. Can you actually go into a little bit more detail? Are there other examples? Um, as you said, you know, you can reference different cat scans or dog scans or cars or whatever it may be. But can you go a little bit more in detail in terms of like real life applications of how this could actually be seen in the real world? Yeah. So like I mentioned with the cat scans, right? If if we had trained a model to view all these images on cat scans and we have a new patient come into the ER and they get a scan done, rather than having maybe not rather than but in addition to having the doctors review the images and the scans and look for anything that's amiss we can also submit this through an ai model that can cross check against medical records from all across the world and and reference these cat scans and determine there's a deficiency here or this is an abnormality or this is an abscess or whatever it may be and it can identify those things that maybe the doctors or the nurses might have missed and then they can you know, focus their attention on that and, and go take care of the problem. And it saves them some time on diagnosing so that they can go and they can take further action when it comes to treating the patients. And that's just a medical example, right? But you could also use it, uh, you know, in 
when it comes to like mechanics, potentially you could have images of different engine bays. You could have deconstructions of engines and you could determine that there's valves that are misfiring. You could determine that there's a cylinder that isn't, um, you know, at, at the right rate. It, it's the applications are really endless and it just depends what industry you're in and what you need to be more efficient so that you can optimize your workload. And that's really where I think the, the key benefits of this technology are. It's not, it's not about replacing people's jobs. It's not about replacing these operations that need to pl take place. It's about making them easier and it's about making them more efficient and it's about aiding the humans in these processes. So Take it away from that then, really, like you said, I mean, you, you, you made a good point. You can really just, it's not just for one thing. It can mm -hmm. be used across a, a variety of markets. And the main thing in, in terms of this whole AI is you're just dumping a, a large database of content and saying, learn this. And then once it learns that, so going back to, I guess, it's like a cat and a dog, so now you're gonna upload all these images of cats to say, and then you upload all these images of dogs. So now if I go in and I go, you know, search and say, you know, I want this type of dog or this type of mm -hmm. cat, that's the overall goal then, right? Is for this to fully know the difference between a cat and a dog. But now when we get deeper into this, can you go to the point of where like, hey, I'm looking for a Yorkie. Like, can you yeah. make it that specific to where like, you know, or a drum, maybe he's like, Give me images of a Rottweiler or yeah. something like that, or a pit bull. Like, can we get that specific with it, Zach? Yeah, absolutely. And honestly, the model can get that specific with it, depending on how it's been trained, depending on what tags are fed through. So, like you said in the example with the dogs or the cats, right? A base level model would be like we submit ten new images, seven are dogs, three are cats. We obviously want the model to recognize that there are seven dogs and there are three that are either not dogs or are cats, depending on how it's been trained. But to take it further, if we had fed the model all these different images of dogs and we had added tags for the specific breeds, mm -hmm. and then we either fed through a text prompt or an, an image prompt, like let's say you were outside and your neighbor just got a new dog and you're like, I've never seen that thing in my life. What is that? So you take a picture and you feed it through the model well, if the model has been trained properly and it's been trained on the appropriate tags, it actually will tell you that's a dog and that's a Yorkie or that's a dog and that's a Rottweiler. And it can get that specific. It's just determined by how well it's been trained. And then again, that validation phase, making sure that the, the model is able to identify those things and, and make those inferences. Yeah, that's very interesting. So roughly how long would it take for the model to be able to learn these things? Like how long does that training process usually take? Sure, so it depends on what model you're using. Um, you know, we, we look at a variety of different models, but one that we looked at in particular was the ResNet 50. And so to train that model, uh, specifically with an L40S, you can train 2,748 images a second. Jeez. And that's that's insane, right? Yeah. Because you think about in a second, I can't even process like more than two images in a second. <laughs> <Literally>. <laughs> so, so like 2,700 yeah. is a ton. Mm -hmm. Well, if you multiply that out to a minute, to an hour, to a full day, yeah. you're looking at like 9.7 million images that can get trained in a wow. single day with the L40S on the ResNet 50 AI model. Wow. And then if you take that a step further, and then you need the model to start doing inferences based on new submissions, new prompts, new images, whatever, it's actually capable of 34,589 images a second of throughput wow. with the L40S when it comes to inferencing. And if we do the same exercise where we multiply that out by the minutes, the hours, the day, mm -hmm. it's 2.3 billion images in a day Did you say that can billion? be inferenced on. Was billion. A billion? A <laughs> wow. That's insane. That's, yeah. I, I honestly, it's it's difficult to comprehend it because of course. you think about 35,000 images in a second, and that's, it's like speed of light. And when I try and determine, like, how fast is that actually, you can't, you can't do it. It's, yeah. it's not possible for a human to comprehend that. And that's, that's the added value of this AI. That's why there's such a craze over it. And that's why there, there's such a large push for it is because the level of compute power and the level of inferencing is so far beyond anything we've seen up until now that it's, it's going to revolutionize a lot of different industries, a lot of different tasks 
and it's it's really cool to witness. Cool. Uh, yeah, I guess, and then kind of like a segue from there then, because I know we, we kind of hit on that, but I, I think another thing that the L40S might be a, a good, you know, focus on is maybe within the digital twin world. Because like mm -hmm. now we're talking about, you know, training AI models and trying to make sure it, again, it can say this is a cat and this is a dog and this is what kind. But now, how, how do you see that working? Maybe like, a, a, let's for example, manufacturing, you know, we, we have a, a warehouse that's going to be built and we want to see how this warehouse is going to perform, you know, when it's sunny out or if it's snowing, how, you know, with RTX technology, how the, the ray is going to trace and, mm -hmm. you know, ray tracing and all that. So the L40S, how do you see that like in a, I guess, a digital twin atmosphere? Because again, the, the big thing with that is you want to see something mm -hmm. before you break ground and go yeah. into development. Like does the L40S, how, how do you think that would stand up for like that task? Yeah, so it's it's going to be ideal for that kind of task because with a digital twin, you're you're training a very large AI model to do a variety of different things and to make a ton of different inferences, right? So, I think it was BMW that built out an entire factory in digital twin before they even broke ground, and what they were able to do is determine exactly how the factory was going to run, where the production lines were going to be where everything on the line was going to be. And let's say if they moved a trash can somewhere, they were able to see if it resulted in any workplace injuries, if it made things less efficient. And they were able to run this factory in the digital twin model over the course of like a decade before they even broke ground. And, and that's something where the L40S is just going to enhance that further because of the inferencing, because of those extra tensor cores, you're getting double the performance from a tensor core perspective over the L40, and you're getting more than double the performance with the tensor cores over an A100. So it's going to elevate your performance significantly, and you should see it in just about every way with the rays, also with the tensor cores, and also with the CUDA cores. Wow, that's really interesting. So even on that same note, that kind of leads into generative AI as well, yeah. because again, when you're creating these, these work environments, whether it's a warehouse, whether you're um, just showing the different examples of cats and dogs, um, the L40S definitely helps enhance when it comes to generative AI, correct? Yeah, absolutely. Because ultimately, that same generative AI is, is going to need to be trained, and it's going to also make those inferences. So if you were to use like a, like an image gen AI, um, you know, it could be stable diffusion, could, could be anything, uh, it could be Dolly, whatever the case may be, that is going to be trained based on whatever images and prompts they've fed through. So if I had, you know, drawn a sketch of an animal and I'm asking this AI model to determine either what it looks like, or perhaps I'm asking it to turn my sketch into a, a 3D image, it's going to take all the images that it's been trained on, everything that it's learned, all the different art styles, the different techniques, and then based on my prompts, it's going to try and output that. And that's where the inferencing comes into play. So if I submit an image of, you know, an alligator, and I say on the prompt, like, I need a, a 3D artwork of a, a hyper realistic 3D artwork of this alligator with a rocket launcher strapped to its back. The generative AI can probably figure that out. And yeah, it's going to yeah. come up with something that's totally wacky, mm -hmm. but it's going to do it in a form that's hyper realistic because I've asked for that specifically. And then I also tagged on the rocket launcher just as like, something something kooky to add on but it's capable of pulling that in because it's probably been trained on all those images as well mm. and it's able to combine them and create a unique artwork based on what it's learned which is is really something that's incredible yeah i think uh, like going on that too like the alligator and just this you know off the wall thing like you see a lot of creators starting to utilize ai too yeah. especially when the youtube space i thought was pretty interesting because the biggest thing on YouTube was always your thumbnail. You wanted to be catchy. You wanted to draw people in going through all these other videos to where now you could utilize AI mm -hmm. and say, you know, put me on a beach or put me wherever, driving mm -hmm. this, and it'll just, it's, it's crazy. You could just prompt these pretty much AI applications and yeah. say, do this, and then it spits it out within seconds or minutes, depending on what it is. It, 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 just, it is. It's very mind blowing how far we've come yeah. in the AI and just uh, what we're capable of doing. Yeah, so, Zach, so it, we, we hit on the L40S. You talked about CUDA cores, tensor cores, and the performance. 
But in terms of like your your main takeaways, like what would be your selling points? And I know you compared it to like the L40. You know, this is the L40s, which I would take it as like the supercharged version of the L40. How would you see the L40s falling within the stack of data center GPUs? Sure. So I think it kind of hits hits a sweet spot, to be honest with you, Derek, because you've got the H100 at the top of the stack, right? And it's it's a super supercharged card. It's it's a beast, and it's it's going to handle anything that you throw at it, and it's going to be the fastest time to train on any AI model. Um, but where the L40s comes in is it's much more available, it's much more cost effective, and you actually get better price to performance than any of the other data center cards in the stack. It offers the best price to performance when it comes to multifaceted workloads. Like if you're doing compute graphics and AI video, that's going to check all three of those boxes. And then, um, you know, if you're only doing compute, the L40s again is, is going to be a strong contender, especially depending on what sort of setup you have, um, you know, in, in the instance of, of training a model, like let's say we tr wanted to train a model on 860 million tokens, right? And HGX A100 is gonna take about 12 hours with eight GPUs. Well, with eight L40Ss, you're actually gonna be able to do that much quicker, about 1.7 times faster. So you should be looking at under, you know, eight, around seven hours of time to process that data and to train that model with an L40S at a better price point than an A100. And it, that kind of speaks for itself, in my opinion. Well, Zach, thank you so much again for your time. I feel like we've hit a lot of great yeah. topics on this podcast. And again, we, we brought it up in the last one. I just brought some specs. So I was like, well, I want to get the expert here. So again, thank you for your time. Yeah. I feel like we learned a lot just in general, yeah. like a lot of good information about, you know, generative AI, how that works, um, AI training, again, the L40S as a whole. It was a lot of good information. So thank you so much for coming to the podcast. Yeah. Hey, thank you guys for having me. I'm always happy to talk about GPUs. It's it's something that's very interesting to me. So looking forward to being on next time. All right. Well, that wraps this up. Uh, Jerome, tell everybody where they can find us. Yes. Yeah, so you can watch our podcast on YouTube and you can also listen to it on your favorite podcast platforms, whether that's on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, etc. And make sure you follow all of our social media at PNY Pro and we'll see you next time. Great. See you in the next episode. All right, take care. Yeah. Yeah.